Now, in part, one of the reasons why uh, the booing took place was because the Prime Minister has gone missing when it came to the cost of living situation. Last year, he took $1,500 out of 10 million workers. Last week, the plan was for the media to absolutely flood the zone with conversation about tax cuts. Now, yes, there was a broken promise, and I'll get to that in a second, but, of course, the idea was that wherever you turned your television on, you would see someone somewhere talking about tax cuts. And eventually, if everyone everywhere is talking about it, then even if the detail doesn't work for you, even if the reality was the broken promise, the message the Australian media would try to send to people is here's Albo and he's here to help. But I was thinking about why this thing is going to land flat if it hasn't already. And it comes down to this one. It's too little, too late. You see, the cost of living problem has been so for about 18 months. And while you're supposed to be thankful for a Prime Minister who finally gets it, loan repayments have gone up anywhere between $14,500 a year for a $500,000 mortgage to more than $30,000 if you've got a million-dollar mortgage. The reality is that while the Prime Minister and all the media says he pulled a rabbit out of the hat last week, how many stories have you read that look like this one? that Australians' reaction to power price surges of up to 83% meant that, as we showed you last year, all sorts of people are trying to find innovative ways to save on their power bills, including the poor bugger who would turn it off at the mains and only turn it on for 15 minutes at the start of the day, a little bit for lunch, and then he wouldn't have it on at night. On top of that, the reality in the last inflation figures that, yes, were the lowest overall headline inflation figure in two years, and while that had a four in front of it, how many other things that you can't avoid that cost you hundreds of dollars had gone up compared to the previous 12 months? Well, you can see here that when it comes to gas and other household fuels, 12.5% increase. Electricity, 10% increase. Bread and cereal products, not that you can avoid those, that's up by double the inflation rate. Rents, again, way higher than the inflation rate. General food, dairy, all higher than the inflation rate that the government was, it was patting itself on the back for as being the lowest in two years. This is why four-fifths of bugger all, some crumbs off the table, are not enough to actually change people's lives. Instead, the hope is to change the political fortunes because remember, when they had taken $1,500 away from 10 million workers who were facing bigger bills than they had in the best part of a decade or maybe even longer, the Prime Minister was telling us that he was helping. Now we are doing something about cost of living. Our primary motivation here is giving more people help with the cost of living. You can't say that you're concerned about cost of living pressure and then refuse to do anything about it. My government is a government of solutions. We acknowledge that people are under pressure, but more than acknowledge it, we are doing something about it. But, of course, that's all the smoke and mirrors. They took $1,500 off you. They are not giving $1,500 back. And when I say back, I mean, it's your money anyway. But, again, today, some examples about the reality of cost of living versus the spin of we're doing something about cost of living. This report came out from welfare services, particularly focused in on Queensland. We're incredibly distressing. The cost of living crisis is plunging Queenslanders into debt. Working Queensland families are spending $200 more than they earn each week. Remember that? $200 more than they earn each week on the bare essentials. The extent of the crisis has been laid bare in a new report from the Queensland Council of Social Services, which shows families are falling more than $10,000 into debt each year because they're doing things like using personal loans or credit cards. The key number? Queensland families, $200 a, a week more than they earn on the expenses to keep a roof over their head, their kids in new school uniforms and food on the table. 
Meantime, another one here, this one from the ACTU. Now, they're trying to make a point about casual workers being able to transfer into becoming full-time workers, but the devil in the detail helps make the point that I am trying to this evening. Cost of living pressures are increasingly being cited by insecure workers, so that's things like gig workers or casual workers, as reasons they're not taking time off, even when they're injured. When likely to be dismissed by employers, the, the latest survey shows that between... that 69% of people say that affordability, keeping the money coming in, is the reason they keep going to work, even when they're hurt. So if the reality is that $200 a week is more than you are spending than the money you earn in a place like working Queensland, the tax return that the Prime Minister wants you to thank him for doesn't get anywhere near $200 a week, certainly even for the people that have been most screwed over by this, the rich people earning over $180,000. Now, I notice, by the way, Jackie Lambie talks about rich people. Well, she's one of them because she earns more than that number. But working Queenslanders spending $200 more than they earn, or well, 14 15 22 32 and $41 is not going to do a damn thing. Frankly, it's like fighting a bushfire with a bucket. So, you see, for the Prime Minister, he gets to say, we're doing something. For the press gallery, they get to say, well, the Prime Minister says they're doing something and the overall cost of this thing is X billion dollars a year. But if the reality is a family spending $200 more than they are earning, the tax cut doesn't touch the sides. People know it. They know, of course, the politics in and around it is a lie. And that's why people are turning on the Prime Minister. And further to this, remember for as long as Albo was the opposition leader, we've been talking about how he's each way. Perfect example would be voting to in the parliament to kill off JobKeeper and then going out and whinging that JobKeeper had ended. Perfect example. We back in the stage three tax cuts uh, in the parliament despite the fact that in the lead-up to the vote we were saying that we opposed them. This was the each-way elbow. But another reason why people are having their issues with the Prime Minister right now is that he is not what he promised to be. Now, I know that every Prime Minister, and I've seen some as close as you can get, and I've seen some who wouldn't even think about setting a Christmas card on fire, let alone actually sending one to me, but... Prime Ministers all at some point start to think that if they throw more of themselves at something, then the problem will magically get better. But when they are eventually the problem, more of them only exacerbates the problem. They also magically think that Australians are so desperately in love with them personally that just like a member of their family, they will forgive them when they tell lies or they under-deliver on what they promise. But these aren't members of our family. They're not even our colleagues. They're not even our friends. They're not even distant second or third cousins. They're politicians who want more power for themselves, who tell us lies in order to fool people at elections, only to turn around and ignore those people until you need them again to win another election. And here's a couple of examples of where people have had enough of the current Prime Minister. Remember, this was the promise of the bloke when he was applying for the job. And I do believe uh, that we can do politics better, and I hope to do so. But the reality was, at the first major test, to see whether politics was any different than it was in previous governments, when the finance minister and one of the mean girls, Katie Gallagher, was clearly proven to have lied to the Senate about her connections to who knew what and when, in and around complaints that were made around sexual assault in the parliament. Did the Prime Minister say, sorry, you didn't tell the truth, bang, you're gone? No, he doubled down. When he promised greater transparency, did all the questions that were taken on notice start being answered? No. Did he open his diary for people to have a look at? No, instead he charged $1,300 for you to apply for the chance to have a look at his diary. And then when the diary eventually turned up, it was only for the first six months of his prime ministership, not all the way up 
until the end of last year or the start of this year. His new politics also fell flat when jobs for the boys became very obvious. There was Kevin Rudd, who was not going to be the ambassador to Washington, but, of course, became the ambassador to Washington. Then there was the behaviour of the trade minister. Now, the trade minister, Don Fowle, remember, runs, apart from everything else, lots of trade little embassies that are around the world, including one in San Francisco. Now, this is where trade representatives of Australia speak to trade representatives or private companies in places like the country that they're sent to, and they're able to negotiate better deals. But this plum job paid for by us, the taxpayer, didn't go to the person who applied for the job, who an independent committee said should get the job. Instead, it went to a one-term senator who was a factional mate of Don Farrell, who didn't even apply for the job. The person who had been selected for the job even had to turn around and train the political hack who didn't apply for the job to now do the job that she should have had. And then there's the line you've heard how many times in the past few days about the Prime Minister and trust. This was the different guy who is going to always level with you and always be honest. My word is my bond. Well, if that's the case, why doesn't he repeat the promise that he made during the election about your power prices? Reducing power prices by $275. By 2025, $275 a, a year. $275 a year. We'll get power prices down by $275 a year. Yet if you ask them point blank to repeat that number today, they will not say it. Why? Because they know they can't deliver it. Instead, it was about lipstick on the pig of the policies that were rejected in the previous election that just got implemented anyway and then supercharged once they were in office. This is a government who says they want Australia to cut its emissions, yet when Australians buy things like hybrid cars, which are better than petrol cars but not as good as electric cars, they've now introduced a luxury car tax of 33 cents in the dollar of every dollar that vehicle costs. So now buying a Toyota hybrid is treated by the tax system as if you were importing a brand new Merc from Germany. That's the reality. Power bills have gone up because they have forced in a demand for an entirely new electricity grid, one that the, the, even the CSIRO said would cost a trillion dollars to do, and you, the customer, has to pay for it. And then, of course, the centrepiece of the past couple of weeks has been that the broken promise is one of the main issues with the Prime Minister and his changes on tax. Now, remember, I've just illustrated why the changes on tax don't actually change anyone's life. $200 more than the income of the average person in Queensland. The tax cuts are, what, $15, $25, $30, $40? He said how many times? And that's way more, by the way, than 15 times that he said he wasn't going to do anything. But he did it. He changed it. And I can tell you this, too, is that to the Labor supporters who think that there's all nuance and context, the reality is that you're the same people who said that Tony Abbott broke his promise when it came to no cuts to the ABC, when in actual fact he didn't cut their funding, he just didn't continually increase the funding. But the context doesn't matter because the lie is proven when people see that there's a difference between words that are said and outcomes that happen. So I was amused to see today the very same people who have lied on so many times in so many different areas. Well, they had to tell us, believe us, when today the push was on to, among other things, change negative gearing. You know, another one of those shortened policies that they had absolutely abandoned like the environment policy that they reheated at this at last election. Instead, despite the fact that there are MPs pushing for it, it's not going to happen, and you should trust us because you can trust us fingers behind back.
Oh, we're not uh, contemplating or considering uh, resurrecting uh, the policies that we took to the 2019 uh, election. And I'll tell you one of the reasons why you can't trust them. Because the very same people who helped inform the decision behind the lie in and around tax are the same people that are now trying to do it when it comes to things like negative gearing. For example, the Australia Institute. It is a Greens think tank. It is a far left-wing think tank, but is often cited by much of the media and certainly the left-wing media as an independent source of information about why the current situation is bad. And they have said about negative gearing that the current tax system desperately needs to change. They're also the same people who told us there were 18 different reasons as to why the Stage 3 tax cuts had to change. Same experts. Will they get the same outcome? Oh, trust us on this one, but not the last one. Maybe that's what Treasurer Grim Jim Chalmers means when he talks about remaking capitalism. Forget what I promise, watch what I do, and even when I do it, forget what I've actually done, because I promise not to do it.